few cases have attracted as much intrigue as the mysterious disappearance of the 25-year-old estate agent Susie Lamplew from Fulham in London in 1986. Decades on, and two investigations later, we are still left puzzled as to what actually happened to this young woman. This is a young lady who disappears from a London street in the middle of a sunny July day and is never seen again. There is no trace of her anywhere, and that is quite extraordinary. She wouldn't just have disappeared without telling anyone. The search for Susie quickly escalated into one of the largest investigations in British criminal history. I have not experienced a similar case to Susie Lamplin. The inquiry will stick in the minds of every police officer that was originally involved. She literally disappeared off the face of the earth. It fascinated people in one way, but equally, it horrified people. Years later, the theories about what happened to Susie Lamplew are rife, making this a crime that shook Britain. Hertfordshire, England. July the 28th, 1986. The brother of Susie Lamplew received a telephone call that will change his life. I was working at a fish farm. And I remember when my dad, I think, phoned me and said that Susie has not returned from her and a time when she was uh, showing someone around a house and they were starting to get worried. Richard's younger sister had worked for Sturgis estate agents in Fulham, London, for just over a year. It was uh, just before my mum's birthday, that, and it was just not a sort of thing that she would have done. It was really worrying. Gradually, information started to feed back to Richard and his family about the circumstances. When colleagues looked into her schedule, they noticed an entry by Susie to show a client around an empty house at 12.45 p.m. We uh, had an, a missing estate agent, um, which wasn't all that suspicious, uh, until we found out that um, where she'd gone to uh, with uh, Mr. Kipper within Sturgis estate agent. Nobody really knew who he was. He wasn't a, a regular customer, and it rang bells that night. There's an oblique reference, I think, to Mr. Kipper viewing Cheryl's Road in the diary. None of Susie's colleagues knew of the name in her diary or had any details for him. Well, we didn't have any clues at all, to be honest. Mr. Kipper was somebody nobody had ever heard of. It was just a name in a diary uh, for an appointment with Susie. As the afternoon wore on, colleagues grew more concerned for her whereabouts. She never returned to Sturgis Estate Agent that afternoon. Uh, and she never went home to her mother's house that afternoon. Um, although she did live in a flat of her own, um, nobody had seen her since about midday that day. You think, well, she'll probably turn up. And she didn't, she, you, know, you know, you didn't know what happened to her. You thought, well, maybe she's had an accident, maybe she's lost her memory, maybe, you know, something's gone, you know, and you, you do sort of, everything goes through your mind about what happens. As the police learned more about the circumstances surrounding Susie's disappearance, they drafted in extra officers and began a meticulous search of the local area. That night, we stepped up the what would have been a normal missing person to a very high-risk missing person inquiry. We went to Susie's flat in Putney. Um, I went to the front door. We, do, we didn't have a key, unfortunately, so I had to force the door open uh, with my shoulders. There was nothing in the flat that made me suspicious that anything untoward or suspicious that happened in the flat. Um, no sign of any struggle uh, or blood or uh, anything untoward. 
Although the flat didn't shed any light on her whereabouts, the team did receive some disturbing news. On our way back to Fulham Police Station, we heard that they'd found Susie's car down in Stevenage Road, which was about a mile and a half away from Charles Road. On further inspection, Susie's car appeared to have been abandoned. The company car she used uh, to ferry clients to view various properties uh, in her role as an estate agent uh, was found unlocked uh, close to um, Bishop's Park and Fulham Football Ground. The car wasn't parked properly. The car was parked um, overlapping somebody's garage. Doors were still unlocked. Um, there were certain things about the car which suggested that Susie wasn't driving that car because of the positioning of the seat. The car was just left in a road, unlocked, no keys. You know, you sort of think she's obviously taken her keys out. Why didn't she lock it? And the police were, they were trying to be as supportive as possible. Didn't know what had happened and how to, you know, respond to it, really. The car was a worrying factor, and residents in Fulham were also reporting some other alarming news. Information was coming through that she'd been seen by locals and had some sort of argument with a, with a male uh, outside Charles Road. This raised concerns even further. Police now had a missing young woman, her car abandoned, and reports of a possible altercation with a man. They rushed to try and find any more clues. The people we needed to interview immediately were her closest friends and work colleagues. Um, and what came from that then escalated to where she associated her friends, where she uh, drank and ate. Um, she was part of a very close-knit group of friends. Um, I think uh, Diana Lamplew uh, called them the Putney set. Um, we had to interview all those, all those guys. There's this window. If you don't do anything within that window, then it gets harder and harder to do. As more time passed, and with little to go off, the police asked for help. Superintendent Carter went public very quickly on, the, on this case, and the help of the media was massive. Uh, the public reaction was huge. And that's what you want. You want the public on board. Um, the public can help you greatly. And there was great public reaction to this. Officers leading the hunt have renewed their appeal for witnesses. The police put out appeals for help in finding missing people almost on a daily basis in London. I still get them on my computer at home from the press bureau at the yard. And they're sold very quickly. It's quite often they're children or sometimes there's someone in distress. But they, the police normally find them within 24, 48 hours, something like that. This wasn't that sort of case. The police knew by the evening of the first day that she disappeared that there could well be something very seriously wrong. By the beginning of August, the police had had over 700 calls from the public about, but with possible information, and they had 100 calls from people who believed they'd seen Susie Lamplew in the, on the day that she disappeared or subsequently. Um, at the same time, it obviously stirred up a certain amount of fear in the public because there were reports that a number of shops in London had sold out of women's alarms uh, because people were concerned about a possible attack on them. As the media picked up the case and the hunt for Susie went national, her family tried to search for any answers. There were no sort of enemies, there were no, you know, major boyfriends who would do this, you know. They had nobody to pin it on. 1986. The Metropolitan Police are calling on the public to help with the disappearance of 25-year-old estate agent Susie Lamplew. Last seen leaving her office to show a client around a property. There have been no sightings of her since. Her car has been found abandoned, and residents have reported an argument between a man and a woman. But this is all detectives have to go off. Why was a car in Stevenage Road? Why? We never know. Was she kidnapped? No, there wasn't a struggle, was there? You know, 
Was she forced into a car? That was never seen to be forced into a car, was there? She went voluntarily to do what? I don't know. Did she go down to a street uh, thinking that she was just going to be with a man to have a quiet chat and things went wrong from there? Despite huge public support, each lead that is provided reaches a dead end. To the frustration of everyone affected, they are left only with theories about Susie's fate. It did dawn on me about sort of like a month or so in that this is it, that she's, there is something, that she has disappeared, that someone's done something, she's, someone's taken her, because there was so much press coverage. We used to have to wash the floor of the shop that we sold fish from, and I would put down the newspaper, and of course, you see my sister's picture in the newspaper, and you sort of think, it's just a piece of newspaper, but do I leave it down there, put it up, pick it up, or, or what, what do you do? You're wanting to keep your hopes up, and you don't go into mourning. I didn't get this feel of loss, because you want to keep your hopes up, you know. You think, any minute now, she'll walk through that door when you were down at mom's, you know. Hi, oh, I just thought I would have to take a holiday. But it never happened. For the Lamplu family, the agony of not knowing what happened to Susie is channeled into the start of a charity in her name. Her parents, Paul and Diana, felt very passionately that something positive had to come out of Susie's disappearance. Um, Diana Lamplu felt that it couldn't all be negative, what had happened. And so within weeks um, of Susie's disappearance, the Lamplus had set up the first meeting of, of the Susie Lamplu Trust. Um, which was really uh, aimed at helping people to live safer, more confident lives um, and to find ways of educating people to take steps to improve their personal safety but without curtailing their freedoms and liberties. I was very, very proud. You know, when my mum does something, she throws herself into it. People say, well, you should be grieving, you should be mourning your loss, your, your daughter, but in, in you're getting all this glorification. But it wasn't to, to her, she saw it as, as something to achieve, to, to strive, to try and stop others getting in the same situation as Sue's. She had some very influential figures behind her, um, and that all helped to keep things ticking along. The, the problem for the police is, alongside that public interest, is their concern for costing. From a small room in the family home, Susie's parents worked tirelessly to spread the important message of personal safety, whilst maintaining the pressure on the authorities to keep up the search for their daughter. But as the months went by, they find nothing. The inquiry went on and on until it was, um, uh, until it was tapered down, probably about a year later. To be fair, the, the Lamplus themselves were assiduous in trying to get people interested, especially Diana Lamplu. Um, but it did begin to tail off. And in, I think it's 1987, the police began to wind the case down. They had no, no good leads. They had no body. Um, they appeared to have no good suspect. And they didn't have a motive. So given the demands that were on the police in the 80s, for example, you had an active provisional IRA campaign going on in London. You had a number of um, high-profile robberies. Um, the police force was not as big as it was by, uh, as it is now, in fact. Um, it's, it was quite likely that they would start to pull the plug on the investigation, or rather leave it to, to sleeping. And when that happens, the press and the media normally begins to back off as well. Publicly, the inquiry into Susie's disappearance continued. But behind the investigation, her family tried to come to terms with their loss. The memorial service we had, I think that that point, I knew she wasn't coming back. Life had to move on. It was really at that point I, I, I drew a line and said, no, she's not coming back, and she's been murdered. And it's always difficult to say that. Over the coming years, 
the public interest in Susie never waned, and her family campaigned hard to keep the young estate agent in everyone's consciousness. The charity went from strength to strength, but more than a decade after she vanished, and with no sightings of her since, her parents made a decision. The Lamplin family went to the High Court and uh, got a ruling saying that because there was no trace of Susie for 12 years, rulings made that they are deceased. This decision to have their daughter officially declared dead coincided with a shock move by the Metropolitan Police. It really morphed into a homicide investigation, I think after that amount of time, with no trace of her financial profile, no one knew where she was, um, you know, she didn't come to, to light in any uh, shape or form. Um, you know, and it was then a homicide investigation. The cold case review looked at Susie Lamplew's case and basically what it looked at were forensic um, advancements in the intervening years. 14 years after Susie Lamplew vanished from the streets of Fulham, the Metropolitan Police pushed to solve the mystery once more. And I was given the task at the end of 1999 to read through the files, and I was appointed the senior investigating officer at that time and commenced uh, a brand new reinvestigation in 2000. I do appeal to whoever it is, please to, to let her go. There was a um, massive media coverage of uh, the Lamplew case uh, in 86 and the intervening years and various theories were put forward. You know, we had the normal, what I call mystics, water dividers, um, amateur criminologists and even some criminologists coming up with various theories, but uh, it did lack um, some hard evidence. Despite this, all the information the police had seemed to point the finger at one man. John Canam, a name that had caught the attention of officers all those years previously, but now was back in the frame. There was a mass of circumstantial evidence that we uncovered in the reinvestigation that pointed to Canan. There were a number of other suspects in the case that we eliminated, and we basically exhausted every line of inquiry that we could. For the first time in 14 years, Officers had their sights firmly on one person, John David Guise Canan, now 46 years old and in prison for other offences. He'd been convicted of an abduction and the murder of um, Shirley Banks in Bristol. Um, and the facts were so similar that it, it needed to be looked at. 29-year-old Shirley Banks disappeared in October 1987 from a car park in Bristol, following a shopping trip. She was never seen again. Her body was discovered in the Quantock Hills in Somerset the following Easter. John Kernan was arrested shortly afterwards. Coincidentally, he wasn't just arrested for that. He was arrested for a string of other sexual assaults abductions and rapes and attempted rapes and attempted abductions. He'd committed a whole series of those offences of which he was convicted around the time of Shirley Banks. They made links between him and Shirley Banks because in his flat, in a briefcase, was a tax disc from Shirley Banks' car. They found a fingerprint from Shirley Banks in his flat as well, but that came later. So that's how he begins to come into the picture. He's got a modus operandi which, which looks very similar. He, as a, he's involved in the disappearance of Shirley Banks, who was snatched off the street. The, the evening before she, was, she disappeared, he tried to snatch another woman. So there's a lot of interest in this. It's the media and the Lamplews who say, hang on a minute, come on. You know, this could well be interesting. Although Canaan had a string of convictions, Bristol is over 150 miles from Fulham. What other evidence could connect this known criminal to Susie Lamplew? The Lamplews later said 
that they had told the police that they thought Susie had a boyfriend in the last few weeks before she died, who they believed came from the Bristol area, which is where Cannon's family lived, actually. And subsequently, the other witnesses came forward saying that they believed she had a boyfriend, that he might be from the West Country. And more disturbing information was to come. She told one of her relatives shortly before she disappeared that she was very concerned about the guy that she was going out with and she was getting quite scared of him. Twenty-five-year-old estate agent Susie Lamplew has not been seen since leaving her office in 1986 to go and meet a client, Mr Kipper. Fourteen years later, police review the case and specifically turn their attention to one man, John Canaan, in prison for the murder of another woman, Shirley Banks, a year after Susie's disappearance. Officers quickly began to build up more circumstantial evidence, putting him in the frame. Canaan was interviewed by us twice. You might find this strange. John Canaan was in prison in the borough of Hammersmith and Fulham, yet he denies ever having been to Fulham. Uh, he knew where Kensington was, knew where Notting Hill was, knew where Hammersmith was, but strangely said he'd never been to Fulham. Uh, incredulous as that might seem, that's what he said, and that's recorded. Um, we could prove that he had. Um, we know he had work experience. Uh, he was released on a daily basis. What is significant, he was released from prison the Friday before she went missing. Now, OK, people say, oh, what a coincidence. I don't believe in too many coincidences, not when they all mount up. And further circumstantial evidence positioned Canaan in the area at the time Susie disappeared. We did a reenactment at the time, and uh, we identified some new witnesses, one being a jogger who said he thought that uh, somebody looking like Susie and, and Canaan having a argument in the car at about the time. Um, it was significant that we believed the vehicle to be a left-hand drive BMW, uh, either um, very dark coloured, either black or navy blue uh, and they drove off at speed. We identified a car that Canaan had been using in crime with a, a criminal associate who were both in the prison hostel next to Wormwood Scrubs. There's other circumstantial evidence where Canaan turned up at a house in Fulham that was for sale, uninvited, without an estate agent and the woman let him in, although she felt a bit suspicious. Fortunately her husband was in the house, uh, he didn't realise that started behaving strangely uh, and the husband came into the room and he left quickly. Um, you got the Sherald Road episode where you got Mr Kipper and you know that is definitely there. We had a witness that came forward that put Ganan looking in the state agent's window the day before Susie went missing. All this alarming information pieced together gradually began to paint a picture of what might have happened to Susie and who could be responsible for her disappearance. And another mystery. The name in Susie's diary also pointed to Canaan, after rumours circulated that his nickname in prison was Kipper. As officers honed in, they looked deeper into this violent criminal's background. He was born in the Midlands, so I think to a middle-class family, went to grammar school. But at the age of 14, he was convicted of a sex attack he worked as a car salesman and uh, eventually got married and had a child. But he was a very erratic character. He abandoned his wife and child and took up with um, a girlfriend. And when, she, when they fell out, he attacked her quite brutally. He was eventually jailed for eight years for a series of sex attacks. And what begins to emerge in his makeup is that he is, or was, um, very attractive to women. He appeared to be very old fashioned. He would, it would start to, he would chat up a girl and then he would uh, perhaps send a box of chocolates or some flowers and then he would appear with a bottle of champagne. 
And he comes over as very smooth, very affable, appears to be a successful businessman, which he certainly wasn't. And he appears to have a rather nice romantic streak, although there's something in the background you won't like, certainly if you're a woman. But what was it about Canaan that drove him to such violence? One of the things about John Canaan, he doesn't like rejection. There is a pattern with former girlfriends where he, when he feels uh, rejected by them, he resorts to violence. One former girlfriend in particular would provide Jim Dickey and his team with some very specific information. There was an episode where she made some comments about Canaan. Well, they had a conversation in a car near Norton Barracks in um, West Midlands, where he said something to the effect, and I'm paraphrasing it, um, who knows, Susie could be there. This is the first time somebody had directly quoted Canaan mentioning Susie in any way and needed further investigation. And that's why Norton Barracks uh, had quite significant meaning in a way, but unfortunately, over the intervening probably 15, 16 years, uh, we looked at, we did scope and exercise in that area, but it was hugely developed, uh, was completely different from what it was uh, at the time. And uh, the advice we were given at the time was it, it, you just wouldn't succeed because you'd have to dig up houses and the foundations and hugely expensive. Whether this comment from Canaan was legitimate or a hollow statement, we may never know. He plays mind games. Canaan does things for a reason, either to throw people off the scent, to impose his Walter Mitty uh, thought process on other people. Another potential clue that has always kept officers guessing is a registration plate Canaan fitted to Shirley Banks' vehicle the year after Susie disappeared. SLP 386S. You could interpret that as Susie Lamplu, uh, 86, year being 86. Uh, what the rest of the figures mean, who knows? Uh, and the last bit, who knows what that means either? There is also an interpretation that could be a reference on a map because the reference does correspond or very close to uh, the area of Norton Barracks in Somerset. And it's the sort of thing Canen would do. He would throw in a sweetener to either draw you off completely or to give you a big clue and see if you were clever enough, almost like a, uh, a crossword clue. With all this information pointing to Canaan, officers took the decision to launch a search for Susie's body. The Metropolitan Police relaunched the investigation into Susie Lamplew's disappearance after her family took the decision to have her legally declared deceased. And with a fresh look at the case, one man became their prime suspect, John Canaan. After receiving particular information, detectives decided not to search a military base, but turned their attention to a site in Somerset. It was a search in the Quantocks. Um, where Shirley Banks's body had been disposed of. That's hugely significant when you look at Canaan's uh, profiling. Um, the fact that he, he disposed of Shirley Banks's body in that region, I, f I felt, and other officers agreed with me, that it was worth exploring. Because as a child, he used to go on holiday in that, in that region. And obviously knew the area quite well. I wouldn't say it's wild, but it's just farmland and forest. We didn't find anything, but it gave us an insight into Canaan's thought process around this. Although they were no closer to finding Susie, officers were determined to keep looking. We did another search subsequent to that, I think about a year later, again in Somerset, uh, in the Somerset levels. Uh, close to one of the rivers. And we searched there because we had some intelligence that Canaan frequented the area and it might be a possible burial site for Susie. We also employed RAF to overfly of certain regions and take photographs and were able to analyze those photographs to say what might be good sites 
to dig because of the impression. We also had the Royal Marines helped us. Hand on heart, I can't say we didn't do things because there were, the obstacles were too high. Yet despite an enormous amount of collaboration between the services, nothing was found at this location either. Whilst the police were keen to draw some conclusion with the searches, this wasn't important for everyone. Maybe it was just getting the person who had killed her. That was as far as I'm concerned. I wasn't interested in finding her body. Uh, I know, I'm, I'd rather leave sleeping dogs lie, uh, just keep her memory. I'm more interested in, in the future and trying to save other people from having the, getting the same thing happen to her. Susie's body may not have been located, but with the mounting circumstantial evidence, Jim Dickey interviewed the man he felt was responsible. From memory, Canan did not come up with an alibi. Now, that might have been deliberate. The thing is, if you give an alibi, uh, you give the police an opportunity to prove or disprove it, which is what we would have done. If you haven't got an alibi, there's nothing to prove or disprove. With Canaan giving nothing away, and no hard evidence categorically pinning the crime to him, the new investigation concluded. Well, Cannon has never been charged. He's arrested, but he's never been charged. It's all circumstantial, no clear link. The prosecutor agreed we'd done a very thorough reinvestigation. Could not see that we, there was anything we could do further. Regardless of this outcome, the police made an unprecedented announcement. I was quite surprised by the fact the police were so upfront about John Cunningham. Normally what happens is if the police do suspect somebody, or very strongly suspect that somebody is responsible, they may well guide the press by saying privately that they believe this may well be the, the, the culprit. But in this instance, in 2002, they were very upfront about it. I'm happy in my own mind that John Cunningham is the man who probably abducted, sexually abused or raped Susie and murdered her. Uh, we said so at a press conference when the results um, were made, which is unusual in the extreme. John Canaan has been interviewed twice by police in connection with Susie's murder since his arrest. Whilst the new investigation didn't lead to an official conviction, it did bring some possible answers for those close to Susie. And in the years since she has vanished, the trust set up by her parents continues to grow. It's been part of my mum and dad's, still my dad's uh, life. He, he's not so much involved in it now, but uh, he still has a bit of a role. And, um, and friends as well. And uh, my uh, brother-in-law and uh, friends of the family are also in uh, trustees as well. So. It's, it's nice to see that uh, uh, everyone's sort of involved. My mum gave her rest of her life for it. There's been a number of achievements over the years. Um, one of the most significant ones has been to really pioneer personal safety for lone workers. We go into workplaces every day of the week, training people on how to take steps to improve their personal safety. And we really focus on people who are working on their own and particularly people who are doing things like house visits. I find it incredibly um, humbling that the family were able to divert their energies into a cause for good, which to this day still does good work protecting um, lone people traveling anywhere in the world, really. We also, over the years, have campaigned um, for a number of improvements to personal safety um, from more of a sort of policy point of view. So it was the Trust that really spearheaded the campaign to bring in uh, licensing for minicabs. Um, and the Trust really um, was the driving force behind the 1998 Act uh, to license private hire vehicles. Since 2010, we've run the National Stalking Helpline. And this year, we celebrated having supported 10,000 victims of stalking. Uh, in the last four years. Many theories over Susie's fate have been explored over the years, one of which, stalking, plays a large part. My informed theory is that uh, Susie was stalked by John Canan. He'd probably spoken to her, might even have taken her on a date. 
Uh, Susie certainly fitted the profile of what John Canen sought, uh, in as much that uh, she was blonde, attractive, worked as an estate agent, um, very presentable young lady, uh, came from a good family. Uh, little doubt that Canen stalked her. Uh, little doubt that Canen uh, viewed properties with her. Uh, that he observed her through the window of the estate agents, which probably drew him to go in and seek to view properties. I think that Susie got into a row with Canan on the day. He abducted her from the car or made her get into the vehicle he had at the time. There then ensued probably quite a very heated row where he basically drove off uh, abducting her. Where he went from there is a matter of conjecture. She would have probably just thought him as a, a normal person, uh, buyer and uh, just uh, went from there and uh, probably uh, she was a goner when she just entered the house or the car or whatever. I was so pleased that the Trust is actually doing a lot more with stalking because it is something that I think that Susan's probably was stalked. And whilst the Trust gathers momentum and changes people's lives, the case to find Susie remains open. The inquiry's still there. It's not been closed, and it never will be closed, uh, until probably Susie's body's found and Canen's either convicted or he's eliminated. In 2010, officials decided to revisit Norton Barracks after some fresh information in the hope a conclusion would finally be met. But this search drew a blank. Officials are hopeful that the technology available today could help solve the mystery, many of which were not around in the 1980s. The lack of technology then, for example, CCTV cameras, mobile phone, cell analysis, tracing, the computer system of homes, forensic ability of DNA. All that today is available, not necessarily back in 1986. Well, we didn't have cell site analysis and CCTV in them days. If we'd have had CCTV in itself, we, the, the inquiry would have been uh, far in advance. John Canaan remains the number one suspect for abducting and murdering Susie Lamplew. He continues to deny his involvement, but has made cryptic remarks in the past. He said to the solicitor in a throwaway remark, um, I may, may well uh, tell all when my mother dies. Uh, the fact that we had the comment means probably it was made or overheard. Uh, whether Canaan supports that or not, who knows? I have come across people like Canan, who I believe is a psychopath, uh, clear and simple. Um, there is a difference between psychopaths and what I call career criminals. Uh, strangely enough, Canan falls in both those uh, categories. A, because he's abducted, serial sex offender, and murdered female victims. Uh, also, he's had a career in criminality involving arm robbery, credit card fraud, check fraud, uh, petty crime, um, which strange enough he'll admit to, but when it comes to the serial sex offending, abductions, kidnaps, murders, he's in complete denial. He's got a full life tariff, which means that he has to serve until he's 65 or longer before he's considered for parole. And my view is, if he ever was released, he would still be a danger to the female population of this country. I haven't really grieved Susan in a way. I've, we've had memorials and, you know, I always remember turning around at the memorial service and thinking, oh, Susan might walk down the, the aisle. And of course, she never did. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, so uh, grieving is the wrong word. It's, Mourning her loss, I suppose, it's, it's, it's in terms of she, she's not there, but we have no body, we have no grave, we have nothing to tangibly f uh, fix on. I do think that it's quite possible that at some time in the future, 
that Susie Lamplew's body will be found. Somebody walking a dog, the dog might find something in undergrowth, which is a body. Uh, there are forensic tests which can now be carried out. There are lots of work that can be done on identifying bodies. And it may well be that she does turn up. I think that so many people looked at her and thought, well, that could be me, that could be my daughter. Um, she was just someone who, who I think was very, very easy for people to relate to. Um, and it was such a shocking thing that happened to her. I also think that Diana Lamplew was an incredibly powerful uh, voice at the time of Susie's disappearance and indeed afterwards. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, very much down to, it's very much down to Diana's passion and ability to really get her message across um, that the Susie Lamplew Trust is still around today. I don't know what it is and I can't put my finger on it. There's something about Sue's Lamplew inquiry that all of us wanted to get there sooner rather than later. And it's unfortunately, uh, even today, we haven't found her. Uh, and I hope to God that one day we do. I don't think of her often as such. Obviously, we have her birthday and we always uh, we used to do lots of absent friends when we had a get-together. She was a very bubbly and, uh, and very happy. I am not one for dwelling on her. Nice memories. Few cases have attracted as much intrigue as the mysterious disappearance of the 25-year-old estate agent Susie Lamplew from Fulham in London in 1986. Decades on and two investigations later, we are still left puzzled as to what actually happened to this young woman. This is a young lady who disappears from a London street in the middle of a sunny July day and is never seen again. There is no trace of her anywhere, and that is quite extraordinary. She wouldn't just have disappeared without telling anyone. The search for Susie quickly escalated into one of the largest investigations in British criminal history. I have not experienced a similar case to Susie Lamplin. The inquiry will stick in the minds of every police officer that was originally involved. She literally disappeared off the face of the earth. It fascinated people in one way, but equally, it horrified people. Years later, the theories about what happened to Susie Lamplew are rife, making this a crime that shook Britain. Hertfordshire, England. July the 28th, 1986. The brother of Susie Lamplew received a telephone call that will change his life. I was working at a fish farm. And I remember when my dad, I think, phoned me and said that Susie has not returned from her and a time when she was uh, showing someone around a house and they were starting to get worried. Richard's younger sister had worked for Sturgis estate agents in Fulham, London, for just over a year. It was uh, just before my mum's birthday, that, and it was just not a sort of thing that she would have done. It was really worrying. Gradually, information started to feed back to Richard and his family about the circumstances. When colleagues looked into her schedule, 
they noticed an entry by Susie to show a client around an empty house at 12.45 p.m. We uh, had an, a missing estate agent, um, which wasn't all that suspicious uh, until we found out that um, where she'd gone to uh, with uh, Mr. Kipper. Within Sturgis estate agent, nobody really knew who he was. He wasn't a, a regular customer, and it rang bells that night. There's an oblique reference, I think, to Mr. Kipper viewing Cheryl's Road in the diary. None of Susie's colleagues knew of the name in her diary or had any details for him. Well, we didn't have any clues at all, to be honest. Mr. Kipper was somebody nobody had ever heard of. It was just a name in a diary uh, for an appointment with Susie. As the afternoon wore on, colleagues grew more concerned for her whereabouts. She never returned to Sturgis Estate Agent that afternoon, uh, and she never went home to her mother's house that afternoon. Um, although she did live in a flat of her own, um, nobody had seen her since about midday that day. Do you think, well, she'll probably turn up? And she didn't, she, you, know, you know, you didn't know what happened to her. You thought, well, maybe she's had an accident, maybe she's lost her memory, maybe, you know, something's gone, you know, and you, you do sort of, everything goes through your mind about what happens. 